Uh, can everybody see that okay? Yeah, super. Okay, thanks very much, Natalie, and to everybody at Animal Think Tank for inviting me along today to do this webinar, and thanks to everybody for coming along to it. Um, as Natalie said, I'm going to be talking about anthropomorphism quite a lot today. Um, I know this can be quite contentious, so I'm looking forward to the chat later and to your feedback on some of the ideas that I'm going to be presenting to you today. So I want to start off with a couple of stories um, and just to think first about what the consequences are of the way in which we tell stories about animals. Um, this is a story on the left hand side um, from quite some time ago. I did include this one for a very particular reason. It is from 1998 and some people may remember it if you are from the UK and of a certain age. This was the story of uh, two five month old pigs um, in a place called Wiltshire in the UK. They'd escaped from a slaughterhouse and they swam across the River Avon to escape. And the national and the international press followed the story of these two pigs as the police and the RSPCA tried to capture them. And um, they were able to stay on the run, as it was described, for quite a while. And the public were absolutely engaged with this story, and so much so that the popular press covered it quite extensively. And they named the pigs Butch and Sundance, and they also called the, the pigs the Tamworth. Um, and when the pigs were finally caught, the public pressure was so much that the decision was made not to send them to the slaughterhouse, as was originally planned, but instead they would live out their lives um, in, in a sanctuary. And you can see here at the bottom on the left hand side, there's a headline from the Daily Mail, which is um, popular press in the UK, um, quite right wing, uh, saying the mail saves the bacon of the Tamworth too. Then there's another story. Now, this one is from 2009, and this is on the right hand side. I know the text is quite small. I've highlighted a few um, passages of text, which I just wanted to point out to you. This is the story which was reported again in the national press um, in the UK. It was about a lorry that was carrying um, pigs to the slaughterhouse. The lorry overturned. Um, a lot of the pigs were caught in the wreckage. Twelve of them managed to escape. Um, they were eventually captured. This is the article that ran in the Guardian newspaper. Um, and these were a couple of the, 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 the bits of text I wanted to pull out. You can see here that these pigs are referred to as a herd of pigs who escaped. Um, there were 12 animals escaped from the lorry that were running free on the road. And then down at the bottom here, um, there were fears that the pigs could cross the southbound lane. It was on a very busy motorway cross the southbound lane and be a danger to road users. What happened to these pigs? Well, um, five of them were injured so badly that they had to be euthanized um, at the, the, the site of the crash. The rest of the pigs were caught, they were put onto the lorry and they were taken to the slaughterhouse and they were killed the same day. So we've got two stories here. In one, public pressure is such that the pigs are saved, they go to a sanctuary. In the other, the pigs, even though they escape as well, they are loaded back onto the wagon and they go to the slaughterhouse. We've got a story here, one ends in life, the other one ends in death. And I picked the story of the Tamworth too because it's a very well-known story, but I could have picked any number of stories. There's Stewie um, who was running around the streets of Brooklyn earlier this year in 2023, escaped from the slaughterhouse. Matilda, who escaped from a farm, was on her way going to be sent to slaughter, had uh, 10 piglets and they were called the Ollerton 11. Again, these were saved from slaughter. Phoenix, um, a calf in the, in the midst of the 2001 foot and mouth crisis. Um, this calf was found underneath the dead bodies um, of other cows, 13 days old. Again, saved, the idea was that she'd risen from the ashes. Um, and there were plenty of other examples that I could have picked. So what is it that makes the public so engaged with some stories of animal escape, whilst others don't engage the public at all? Well, in some cases, you can see some similarities in the escape stories where the animals are saved. In those escape stories, we usually have animals who are very young. They tend to be individuals, then they're named. In the case of the Tamworth 2, 
although they're there's there's two of them, they're still individuated and they're given names, so they're identified in their own right as individuals. What the reports tend to do is they use very familiar narrative devices to frame them. They're what we call intertextual references. So that's when you take one story and apply it to another so that it makes sense. So in this case, they use the story of Butch, Butch and Sundance from Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, the idea of these two kind of felons, these two naughty um, sort of anti-heroes on the run, and they apply that to the escaped pigs. Uh, they call them the Tamworth Two, again, this idea of, you know, two sort of so two, two, two sort of naughty creatures on the run. Um, they're also referred to as pigs being babe-like. Uh, so there's references there to Babe, the story Babe, which was both <laughs> a book and, uh, and a film. And what was really clear is as well is that they were anthropomorphized. In the story where the pigs are sent to the slaughterhouse, there's no age mentioned. They're treated as a group. Remember, they're just a herd. Uh, there's no familiar narrative framing at all. There's no links to popular escape stories. There's very, well, it's all very factual. And it's very much focused on the human experience. So there's nothing there to do with the trauma that those pigs would have gone through, what they were feeling, how, how they experienced that situation. It was totally focused on the human experience. So what this tells us is that how we tell stories about animals really matters. And that's where I want to start. So I really want to concentrate on the anthropomorphism aspect of this and a few other sort of components, which I think are really, really important when we're telling stories about animals. So the key things that I'm going to be looking at today are to do with narrative, how anthropomorphism is used, where we get public engagement and understanding, and where I think that stories are able to elicit empathy and perhaps how they do that. But the first question we always need to ask is, well, what can anthropomorphism actually do? And I'm not saying this without any basis, because we know that stories shape understanding. And there's certainly what we might think of as an anthropomorphic tend tendency in popular media. So everywhere we look, we see anthropomorphic stories. But what we know from recent studies is there's actually a relationship between anthropomorphism and both empathy and changes in behaviors. So we see links between um, anthropomorphism in stories and pro-environmental pro behaviors, also in increased moral concern for other animals. And there are debates out there about whether anthropomorphism can enable people to understand better the experiences of animals and therefore elicit some sort of empathetic connection. So there is there is something behind what I'm going to talk about today. There's some there's some studies that have been done and there's much more work that needs to be done. But we're finding some very positive evidence for the use of anthropomorphism. But the problem is, is that when we think about anthropomorphism, often we'll think about two types. So on one, we have them both represented here. So on one hand, we have the idea that anthropomorphism is dreadful. We need to stay away from it. It's a form of what people call Disneyfication. This is where we simplify the animal so much that it just becomes a human in animal clothing. So they're oversimplified. There's no recognition of their species specificity or their individuality. They're just little humans wrapped in fur or feathers. And then on the other end, we have critical anthropomorphism. And this is something which is used by certain parts of the scientific community, particularly in ethology. And it's used as a method. So anthropomorphism is used, but it's combined with very deep understanding and knowledge of species behavior. So we've got the popular form on one, on one hand with Disneyfication. And then we've got, if you like, the scientific version of it, which is critical anthropomorphism on the other hand. Um, and what I want to say is that we need to forget about these two types, because what happens is when we think about anthropomorphism, we have this horror, ah, don't want to use it, it's really worrying, we need to be sort of, um, we need to stay away from it, we won't be treated seriously, we'll be accused of not treating animals seriously, we're getting rid of their individuality, we're not recognising their species, specificity, their individuality, and so forth. 
And I want us to get past that now, because I think that anthropomorphism can be a key narrative strategy that can be both effective and can engage empathy. So I've got um, a little kind of wheel here of all the things. So forget about the two types for now. I want to think about it in relation to these different factors. And I'm only going to go through them very quickly because um, I'm just going to refer to each of these in the different case studies that I'm going to talk to you about today. So just so that I'm kind of clear on the sort of te te terms that I'm using, I'm just going to go through. So I'll just explain what, what each of these are and how I'm understanding them. Um, so this is what I think. These are all the factors that I think affect anthropomorphism. So the first one is mediation. Basically, when we tell any story, it's mediated. Um, it goes through a process. So what we think about mediation is basically everything that happens to communicate or circulate content. So it's the idea that there's something that happens in between the real subject over on one side and what's received by the viewer um, or the listener at the other end. So it's everything that happens in between. Um, it's often a complex set of decisions and choices if you're making a film or you're making content for social media and so on. But every story is mediated. OK, there's a subject that gets mediated. It pops out the other end and it's received by a viewer. So the example here that I'm giving you is of, you know, a lion. Um, there's choices that are being made about how to film him. He's on boxes here. There's certain lighting. They're using certain technologies. And then what we have is the final result. So it's what reaches the viewer, which is the trademark here of the um, MGM film studios. So mediation, everything that happens between the subject, which is the lion, and between the viewer, which is you know, me, for example, looking at that image of the lion. Everything that goes on in between that is the mediation. Then the genre, and I'm going to talk about this quite a bit today. I would probably take a guess that if you took a look at the two posters on the left hand side of this screen, you'd be able to tell me without even seeing the films, even if you don't know the films, you'd probably be able to get tell me, take a good guess at least at which genre these films are. And if I described them to you and said, you know, don't look at these posters, but what you'll see here is um, an image of an orca. There's going to be an image of um, a male figure with their arm stretched up in the air. The colours of the image are going to be kind of orangey and blue. That might not give you any spe specific understanding of what it is. But then as soon as I show you this, there are cues in here that tell us how to read these images and how to understand what the story will be. So they're the genre cues. And we are very well versed in how to read genre cues. In fact, more so than we ever realize. It's what film marketing relies on. So genre is really important because it shapes how we interpret the subject and it sets up expectations about how we should understand the story that we're going to be told about the animal. So very important. And I'll keep coming back to this idea of genre. Narrative and perspective, I'll refer to as well. Narrative, if you've been to one of the animal think tank sessions before, you've probably talked quite a bit about narrative. So I won't say too much about it, except to say it's basically the organisation of the elements of a story. You can reorganise those elements and you'll produce a different type of narrative. And I will talk about how you do that. Um, and also we have to think about whose point of view the story is being told from. Remember the pigs at the beginning. Is it told from the pig's point of view? Is it about the pig's experience or is it about the human experience? And then effect and emotion. And often these two terms are used interchangeably, and sometimes I may use them interchangeably today. Um, really, effect is just the visceral feeling or the visceral response that you have to something. And then emotion is it goes through the cognitive process. We put a name on it and we give it a name and we call it an emotion. So effect is the visceral response. The emotion is the cognitive processing of that response and the name that we give it. But a lot of narratives are able to engage us emotionally, and that is very important. And that's what I'm going to talk about when it comes to sticky narratives. So effect and emotion, very key to um, this presentation um, and how we get to this idea of an emotional appeal and an emotional engagement for an audience. 
and how they're related to anthropomorphism. And then finally, I use the word discourse. I know other people will use the word framing. Um, this is just very straightforward. It's really just about what can and can't be said about a subject. Um, it tends to um, be governed by particular forms of knowledge and authorities and experts. And I'll talk a little bit about that as well um, today. And I've got here some examples for you. We've got David Attenborough at the top. We've got Walt Disney at the bottom. Um, they will talk about animals in very different ways. If we heard David Attenborough talking about mice, we would think about it happening in one way. And if Disney was talking about mice, we would think about it. You know, it would be very, very different. So it's the type of knowledge that they bring and the type of authority or expert that they that they are, which will frame what can and can't be said about a particular subject. And obviously thinking about animals in this case. So discourse or framing, um, very, very similar. So I want to make this point first. Every time we communicate human to human communication, there is an inevitability that you will anthropomorphize. And the reason for that is because when we tell stories, we tend to apply agency and purpose and intention and psychological motivation, even if we're talking about um, inanimate objects, even if we're talking about the, commute, the computer that's done this terrible thing to us and is driving us crazy, for example, we will, Im we will imply some sort of intention and so forth, even if they're inanimate objects. So it's almost inevitable that when we tell a story, we will anthropomorphize. And I think we need to capitalize on that a little more because there's an inevitability to it. So let's harness it and let's use it as a strategy. But what you might say, can anthropomorphism tell us about animals? Because there's a problem, isn't there? Remember back to the problem of Disneyfication and so on. But I'm going to give you some examples here where animals have actually been what we might class as Disneyfied. Um, and these stories can tell us something. So Finding Dory, for example, that told us that um, it gave us a morally relevant message. It told us that animals prefer free roaming to being in cap captivity. Happy Feet, again, if you like, a Disneyfied version of uh, penguins and penguin life but it told us about the plight of animals due to climate change. And then Occhio, which I'll talk about today, um, which is very much Disneyfied, and which is a story that delivers a message that animals don't want to die so humans can eat them. So we can still deliver a strong message even when we use this kind of process of Disneyfication, even if you like at its most extreme. So I want to talk to you today about three stories. And they're stories about anthropomorphism, um, animals, and empathy. And um, they, they sort of get a little bit shorter as I go along. So the first one will be a little bit longer than the other two, but, but they do get a little shorter as I, as I kind of go through this presentation. So the first story I want to tell you is a story about kangaroos. And it's a story about these three kangaroos. Um, in um, 2016, um, an amateur photographer um, called Evan Schwitzer was um, going through his neighbor's property and he saw three kangaroos. Um, um, the male kangaroo seemed to be holding on to the female kangaroo who had outstretched arms. She seemed to be outstretched arms you know, towards the joey um, and she was dying. And so he took pictures of this as it happened. and. He noticed that the male kangaroo and the joey stayed by the female's body and wouldn't let any of the other kangaroos come up to her. And they stayed with her until she died. And Evan posted these images um, on a local social media site and they were picked up by his local newspaper. And the story was then picked up internationally. And it was huge, certainly in Australia and the UK, but elsewhere as well around the world. And the, it was covered in many, many press outlets, many, many news outlets. And here's just a few examples for you. Um, so there's a few headlines here just to point some out. Dying kangaroos said goodbye, um, captured by Harvey Bay local. 
um, heartbreaking moment, kangaroo cradles dying mate in his arms as mum reaches for baby Joey one last time. Um, the one for the courier, you might not quite be able to make it out. Uh, it says tenderoo. This is the incredible moment. A mourning kangaroo um, gently cradles his dying companion as she took her last breath in front of her Joey at Greenland's Fraser Coast. And there was a quote that was used extensively through the papers um, from Evan, who was eyewitness to this, um, this event. And he said he would lift her up and she wouldn't stand. She'd just fall to the ground. He'd nudge her, stand beside her. It was a pretty special thing. He was just mourning the loss of his mate. And this really captured the attention of the public and it was shared extensively on social media. And here's a little snapshot of you from Google Trends. So you can see um, this is um, uh, sort of gives you a sense here of um, the, um, the pattern in terms of what people were searching for at the time. And you can see here that the searches for kangaroo photo, grieving kangaroo and mourning kangaroo. There's a huge spike here as people were searching for, um, for the story and for the image um, over the, the few days when this was being covered by the press. Um, but no sooner had this been circulating for a couple of days that there's uh, a new set of um, stories started to emerge. And they came on the back of a couple of scientists who came forward and said, yeah, actually the photos that you've all been looking at, this is not something to do with a happy family or you know, the, uh, the female dying. This, this actually is a story um, about uh, a male kangaroo um, who's probably killed the female whilst he's been trying to mate with her. And so I've got the two quotes here again that were used extensively throughout the newspapers. Um, and I'll just very briefly read out the first one. Great photos of the kangaroos, but I think they're funda fundamentally misinterpreted. The male is clearly highly stressed and agitated. His forearms are very wet from him licking himself to cool down. He's also sexually aroused. The evidence is here sticking out from the scrotum. Yes, in marsupials, the penis is located behind the scrotum. This is a male trying to get a female to stand up so he can mate with her. Um, and then the other quote from another scientist pointed out that often um, mating process can be um, particularly awful um, and he, he says abusive and the females can actually die in the process. Um, and he believed that's actually what had happened here. So they, they essentially accused the public of overtly anthropomorphizing um, this set of images. And they said, you are all misinterpreting in this story. And here's the real story. And this was covered by all the same press outlets as the, um, the grieving kangaroo story. So the media framing suddenly changed. Um, and I've given you a few accounts here, which came from different, uh, different, um, different publications. Uh, National Geographic, it appears this is a classic case of anthropomorphism. While it's in our nature to assign human feelings and behaviors to animals, the truth tends to be much more scientific and much less cute. Um, kangaroo and grieving photos may have been killed while trying to mate, scientists says. And then we get right through to, you know, CBS, New York Post and the Metro saying that this was kangaroo necrophilia, um, that the public are mistaking it for tenderness. Um, the New York Post refers to the male kangaroo as a horny killer, um, and the Metro um, refers to this as, as an act of rape. So in light of all of this new scientific evidence and the new factual evidence that came forward and the coverage of um, the, the story, the new story now by the media, what happened? Well, I just want to sort of compare these two stories, the, what's at the heart of these two stories. First of all, I'm just gonna give you the example from the Daily Mail. So here we have, um, please don't die, the heart-wrenching moment, a mother kangaroo reaches for a joey one last time before dying in the arms of their male companion. Compared to the Guardian, um, which I'm gonna take as the sort of midpoint here um, of the, um, the, the, the coverage of the, of the scientists, um, the kangaroo and grieving photos may have killed while trying to mate scientists as, and think about what these framing devices are doing. So in the first one, the first interpretation, we are asked to think about this in terms of cues which we take from melodrama. So we look at the outstretched arms of the female, we look at her eye line, 
we look at the fact that the male is holding her head, he seems to be holding it tenderly, he puts her head down on the floor. We are told that this story is a story of a family unit. It brings to mind the ideas of maternal sacrifice. It certainly gives us a sense that um, kangaroos have an emotional inner life. And it's something that we can share. We understand that sense of um, trauma and distress when a loved one dies. Compare that to the way in which the um, the story is reframed after the scientist's evidence. Um, and at best, it becomes some sort of horror. At worst, it's some sort of sex comedy. And the focus, we're asked to shift our focus. So no more are we looking at the outstretched arms and the arms holding the head of the female tenderly. Instead, we're asked to look at the scrotum of the male. So we're asked to shift our visual cues in line with our generic expectations. So the genre that we've suddenly moved into changes the way in which we're supposed to view these images. But the public completely rejected, not completely, but, but pretty much rejected the, what we call the horny kangaroo story and continued to accept the grieving kangaroo story. And the Google searches for grieving and mourning far ex out see, um, exceeded those for the horny kangaroo story. And the media, social media shares, again, um, completely outstripped um, the grieving story, completely outstripped the horny story. And even when people were posting the idea of the, um, the story of the, um, the, 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 the female dying because of mating, um, people were um, refuting that and saying, no, this is a story of grieving. And the public engagement was huge. And there was a real pushback against the scientific account. So we have the popular account and we have the scientific account. And there was a huge pushback against the scientific account. So what we have here is a story of, excuse me, sorry, of sticky animal emotion. There was a real public disinterest in and a refusal of that alternative reading. And this was because when we have emotions or feelings which suddenly become attached to subjects or objects or even places, they tend to become sticky, those stories become sticky. So when we have feelings about a story, when, it's in, when it engages us emotionally, that story becomes much stickier than if you have just factual evidence presented. And so in this case, because this was a story of emotion, it was something that people could understand. The story stuck with them because their emotions, their, feeling, their feelings became attached to the, to the subject. Um, and because of that, the kangaroo grief and the idea of kangaroo grief became a sticky story. Um, what we had there was a set of shared genre cues that people understood. And those cues are very strong. So remember the, the melodrama cues, which are about kind of this sense of touch. So the male touching the female, um, the way in which the female is looking, the idea of maternal sacrifice in the family unit and so on. And there was a shared meaning and an emotional experience which could be understood between human and animal. So it became very difficult to dismantle and reestablish new meanings for the cues in this particular case. So even though the public were presented with what we might think of as the facts of the story, because those facts did not in any way talk about kangaroo emotion, the public completely rejected it. So what we can see from this is there are real emotional appeals in stories that use genre cues and stories that use gendered norms. And I'll come back to this because this relates to a study that we did um, with the Center for Human Animal Studies, which I'm going to talk about a little bit at the end. So gendered norms, particularly parent family or um, parent child relationships are ones that engage um, audiences, they engage um, people in the story because they're relatable. We had in terms of genre, we had the melodrama versus the sexual comedy or even perhaps a, a horror. Um, there were gender stereotypes that were easily transferable to the kangaroos. Anthropomorphism was constructed by scientists as the public mistake. But in doing that, they denied that kangaroos had an emotional life. 
And so this was refuted. This was outrightly rejected by the public. So there was a greater public interest in this story of kangaroo grief. So I want to tell you a second story now, and this is one where the narrative became unstuck and we got a new sticky narrative in its place. And this is the story of slow lorises. And um, many of you will actually know about this um, because it's a campaign that was um, created by International Animal Rescue um, quite a few years ago now, but it's still ongoing. And it was in response to um, some videos of slow lorises who were being kept as pets. And particularly this um, one video, which was about a slow loris, or it was a group of videos about a slow loris called Sonia. Um, and this video went viral. And so in the video, we would see, for example, slow lorises. There were other ones as well, but we would often see slow lorises who were kept as pets holding little mini umbrellas, um, eating fruit and looking into the camera, um, lifting their arms up because supposedly they were enjoying being brushed, groomed or, or combed in this case, um, and often seen eating, um, being given food to eat, rice balls and with videos um, of that. And Sonia became um, a sort of viral um, star of these videos um, with millions and millions of shares of, uh, of the videos. And underneath those, those videos, you would see people saying, oh, she's so cute, she's cute, she's adorable, I want one, where can I get one, um, and so forth. And in fact, there was a study done and it was noted that the trend for keeping slow lorises as pets um, and this pet trade is um, supported by um, illegal capture the pet trade in slow lorises is illegal um, and but the um the trend for keeping slow lorises grew as a result of um or in large part as a result of these videos being shared so widely um, across social media but the truth of these videos was that the arm lifting which people saw as so cute and often you would see this image of sonia being tickled um, and lifting her arms up. In fact, what was happening was that she was lifting her arms up because she was trying to recruit venom from her brachial glands in her arms. Um, and lorises only do this when they're absolutely terrified. They have to be petrified to do this. But she's doing this and she's trying to recruit the venom. It's then transferred into their mouths and then they will bite. And that's how they transfer the, the venom through the bite. So what we're seeing here is actually a loris who is, who is absolutely terrified for her life. And so International Animal Rescue um, created a video um, and in it, um, they made a whole series of very strong emotional appeals to the audience. And what they did that was really important was they took the original Sonia footage um, and they recut it with images um, of documentary images of what happens in the illegal um, loris pet trade. And that included things like tooth extraction. So um, before, the, before the lorises go into the pet trade, um, they're taken and their teeth are pulled out with pliers without any sort of anesthetic. Um, many of the lorises die during capture, during trans transportation. Um, when lorises, they're very uh, affected by, uh, by strong light. Um, and so, being put into houses and obviously in front of cameras and so on um, with strong lights, that again was, was a form of torture for them. And so um, Peter Regan uh, was asked to front the docu, the, the, the small sort of documentary um, video that circulated. Um, and in it, he had a commentary that was really fascinating. He did the piece to camera, so he's talking to camera and what he did was ask questions and they were along the lines of, if you knew that this was torture for the loris, would you really find it cute? If you knew that she was terrified, would you want to share this? So there was a questioning right the way through the commentary. He was asking people, how do you feel now you know that this is how Sonia actually feels? So they reorganized the narrative. They took the original story, they took the original footage of, of the Sonia videos, and they cut it together with the images of the illegal um, 
Pat's um, Pat trade and what happens to lorises. Um, and as a result of that, um, there was a huge um and it was it was very very popular there was there was a huge public outcry against the the slow loris videos and so what we found was um i did a, a short study um on this particular campaign and the results of this campaign um and um what happened was that the there was an active public dissemination of the message so the public were posting the link to the um, IAR video and the campaign website in the comments for the Slow Loris video. Um, so they were actively participating in trying to change the message. They were active in the dissemination of the new message. Um, they commented, they changed the, the narrative. It was no longer about this being a cute video. It was about this being torture, abuse and cruel. They demanded the videos to be removed, which many of them were. And some of the comments actually referred to what was happening. So they were very species specific, which showed that people were listening to the message um, and they understood that um, the lorises were actually recruiting the poison and they referred to the, 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 the tooth um, extraction as well. So just very, very quickly, just to say that when I did the study of this, um, we saw that 96 percent of comments about the Sonya video, this is a month after the release of the IAR video, 96% of comments on one Sonya video over a month um, were negative comments. So they went from 100%, this is cute, positive comments to 96% negative comments. And as a result of this, the Slow, um, the slow Loris channel, which was on YouTube, uh, was actually disabled. So this is an, this is an example of unsticking um, and creating a new sticky, uh, sticky narrative. In both interpretations, the lorises were attributed with an emotional life. In one of them, she's happy and enjoying everything. And in the other, she's being tortured and it's dreadful and, and awful. We get this shift from cute to um, acute response to an empathy response. And the public were mobilized and they actively spread the message. So I think what's really key here is that we can see again, just to remind you of those, uh, those genre cues, when we see the slow loris and she's holding an umbrella or feeding herself with rice balls, we're, we're meant to see it in a fun comedic frame. So the genre cues are see this as a comedy. Our response is, oh, that's cute. Oh, that's funny. Um, whereas when it was reframed through the video um, that was circulated with Peter Egan's commentary, we then have the drama and the documentary cues. It becomes serious. We're told to understand or reinterpret the story in a different way and to reinterpret her emotional um, state as well, which was important. So what we got was a shift. We was no longer looking at the cute Loris. Instead, we're identifying with her distress. And then finally, and very quickly, I want to mention Okia. So um, I just want to mention this because of the genre mixing that went on in this. And so what Arkia did, it was a film released in 2017. It was uh, a Netflix original movie. Um, it uh, was incredibly popular. It was a story of um, a super pig um, who is um, the pet of a small girl. And the super pig is then reclaimed by the organization that's produced these genetically modified pigs. And it's the story of her being rescued, of Arkia being rescued and reunited um, with um, with her young um, her, her young companion, her young human companion. What this film did was that it drew on um, a whole range of different genre cues, but it incorporated the realities of slaughterhouse practices and gave them a kind of fantasy element. It's what I call an advocacy fiction. It's a form of political filmmaking. Um, and what was really interesting was that this was a film that um, absolutely, without any shadow of a doubt, increased the public engagement with um, the Animal Liberation Front and changed the narrative around the Animal Liberation Front. So there were huge shares on social media. There were a lot of people who were posting about how they thought the Animal Liberation Front was great. There's a huge peak in interest in the ALF um, after the film's release. Um, and a lot of shares on social media talking about how the ALF do really, really great work. Um, but there were a lot of concerns raised about the Disneyfied images that was used, uh, that were used to market the films, a few of those images there. Um, and you can see, you know, Oki the Super Pig, 
um, greatly anthropomorphized in the film. She behaves like a great big puppy. Um, and concerns that actually this was used and it disguised the horror of the film. And so children, it wasn't suitable for children. Um, and people were really concerned. And actually adults said, we need to keep children away from this film because it could actually turn them a vegetarian. Um, oh, the horror. Um, and in fact, um, I had a look and I was really interested to get a snapshot of the public reception of this film. So I did a really short little study of this. Um, and it turned out that 63% of parents um, said that the movie wasn't suitable for children. However, 81% of children who watched this film were positive about it. And they said, yes, it was scary, but it was scary because it depicts the realities of industrial farming and slaughter. And pretty much across the 81%, they said that it shouldn't stop adults and children watching it, and they should watch it for both entertainment and educational reasons. There's a little quote here from somebody who was 14 who said, you need to watch this film. Yes, it will haunt you for weeks, but the concept and the message behind it is eye-opening. There was a big public impact from this film, just to mention a few things, Peter had 21,000 requests for vegan starter kits in the month following the film's release. Huge upsurge of public support for the ALF on the, um, the film's social media channels. People um, anecdotally decided to go, talked about deciding to go vegan um, after watching the film. Um, so a lot of public impact uh, that we know came from that particular film. It used anthropomorphism. It used it um, and it used the Disneyfication um, to depict the realities of slaughterhouse operations. And that film's anthropomorphic message importantly reached children and young people. And that's another one of the reasons why I think that we have to review our use of anthropomorphism and draw it into um, the range of different tactics that we can use when we're telling stories about animals. So, I think that anthropomorphism then is a strategy. I think we can rewrite the meanings of animals and their experiences. I do believe it can mobilize public um, empathy, empathy for other animals. A couple of caveats just to mention here. These are results that we got from a study that we did, um, which was funded by the Vegan Society. Um, it was done by myself and um, my colleagues at the Center for Human Animal Studies. We do need to be careful because there is a degree of cynicism um, from people when you overtly anthropomorphize. However, what we did find was that anthropomorphism is, tends to be a natural outcome when people are looking at images. Um, people respond very well to images, particularly of images, young, of images of young animals or relationships between parent and child and so on. Um, Anthropomorphic narratives are a really great way of communicating, increasing trust and awareness, um, but we need to be careful about um, designing narratives that somehow elicit guilt. And one of the things that was very interesting was we did find that shocking or distressing um, imagery often leads to disengagement. Another reason I think that anthropomorphism can be a really good way of getting past that. So my top 10 key takeaways to finish um, for you then. Use anthropomorphism as a narrative strategy. Intertextuality, link your message to existing popular cu cultural narratives. Remember the, um, the links at the beginning um, to Butch and the Sundance, um, Butch and Sundance and so forth. Look out for cultural moments, successful films or media stories that capture the public attention and capitalize on those. Try to produce sticky narratives. Remember that emotions and feelings attach to narratives, to stories, to subjects. You need to engage the emotions of people when you tell a story. Um, the emotional lives of animals can be shared experiences that people can identify with. People respond very well to those parent, family, child relationships and also to um, uh, companion animal relationships. Think about genre cues to help shape your audience's understanding. Um, create those sticky narratives. Use individual named animals. That can work really well. Different audiences need different narratives. Um, not everything is going to work for everybody. Um, if you are thinking about how to create content, one of the things I would strongly ask you to do is to consider now comics, graphic novels and children's books. I think it's really important that we're entering into those areas. It's also really unlikely that one story is going to change any individual's mind or habits. We need lots of stories out there. Um, 
I've got some resources for you um, at the end here. Um, all of the examples that I've given to you today, um, I've written about, uh, they're in various books and things that um, I've been involved in or studies that I've done. So you can follow up any of those through um, the, uh, the resources that I've given you there. I've also given a link there to uh, social issue graphic novels. That's really just, um, uh, it's, a, it's a short piece which just explains about how graphic novels are being used nowadays. Um, I think it's something that we should be using uh, a little bit more. And so I'd be really interested in, uh, in people's responses. Uh, thank you very much. I'll just put that, that next slide on for you, Natalie. Great, thank you so much, Claire. That was amazing. Um, just to let everyone know, um, Beth is going to share Claire's slide deck, so you'll be able to access the um, resources and kind of jog your memory about all the amazing insights that Claire shared. And we'll also share it on our narrative newsletter. And I think Beth's going to put a link in the chat if people aren't already signed up to our narrative change for animal freedom newsletter. You can sign up to that, and this is where you can also find out more about other upcoming webinars we've got. So we're either having kind of conversations with um, great thinkers like Claire, or we're also sharing our own research um, from Animal Think Tank as well. So um, yeah, Beth's gonna send a link in the chat to the newsletter and also our next webinar, which is gonna be looking at our latest public research. So Claire, if you don't mind um, stopping sharing your screen and then we Stop. can open up the floor to some questions so feel free to either put a question in the chat or you can either raise your digital hand and ask Claire um, directly but yeah Claire just thank you for an amazing webinar I just think Thanks, yeah man. you really showed how anthropomorphism is like a bridge to helping us identify with other animals so yes. yeah that's my big takeaway from this so yeah feel free to put any questions you have in the chat for Claire I'm sure it's lots of um thoughts and ideas people will be taking away from this. Beth? I'll, I'll kick off. Just yeah. sorry. Thank you so much, Claire. That was so interesting. Um, I guess what struck me, and I'll try and uh, communicate this succinctly, but I um, something we put up against when we um, you know, via our research and counter narratives that work, is that sometimes they're narratives that we actually don't really want to, uh, you know, um, activate in people. Like, for example, that it can be that it's actually it's actually cheaper to eat a plant based diet. We don't necessarily want to activate that in people when we're trying to create values around caring for other animals rather than caring for our pockets. So. I guess from that perspective, I was wondering in a sort of strategic way, we know that Disneyfication is problematic as well as having these great um, emotional um, impacts on people like Finding Dory was one of the examples you used. Um, if we're going to sort of capitalise on that, how do we avoid sort of longer term damage? How do we do it sensibly and strategically? I think this is very much on a case by case basis. I don't know that I could give you a general rule here for this, because I think what you have to do is you 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 have to think very carefully about the sort of resources and sources that you're using. I don't think that you can necessarily see all of the long term impacts and how people are going to interpret things and the sorts of messages. Um, it can be very difficult. I'm not denying that it can be very, very difficult. What I think that we have to do, though, is we have to take that step and we have to actually explore the opportunities that we've got to do it, because if we don't, we're missing out here. I think we're, we're seriously mi missing. Um, yeah, missing out on some great opportunities. I think if you look to, for example, the conservation movement at the moment, actually, the conservation movement is doing this. They're actually jumping on every popular film that comes out that has any kind of conservation message attached to it or anything to do with individual species. Um, and they're trying to use that message to capture the public attention. So even if it's something the film doesn't necessarily have that message in it at all, they're still using it because it's a way of, if you like, getting um, 
a, a public that's already pre-cued to understand that, yes, I am interested in that particular species or, yes, I have an emotional attachment because I saw the film and so forth. I think that there are real risks in a lot of this as well. And the key risk that I often see that happens is that people become really engaged. Oh, I love that. I want that as a pet. That is one of the things that I think we see all the time. And we do need to be incredibly careful because um, there's there's a huge risk. And we see it with all the popular films that come out. Um, and we see it with the uh, popular, the viral content that gets you know distributed on social on social media. Um, so there are big risks there. There are, and I'm I'm not trying to underplay those. And one of the things that I do, I, I've written a book on anthropomorphism. And one of the things that I say is that is that we can see it and we can be critical of it, and we can see the benefits of it, and both of those things can happen at the same time. And sometimes it's about taking a calculated risk here, because if you are able to reach what could potentially be millions and millions of people, then is it not worth taking that that step? And yes, there could be possible risks there, but there is as well a way of potentially reaching lots of people. And if the message is really well crafted, I do believe that it can get through. I think that the Slow Loris campaign is a really good example of that because there was no doubt. I mean, this was still about lorises being cute and being adorable and do we really want to hurt them? But it engaged people's empathy. So I think that the, the message got out there. I mean, we're still seeing a huge, there's still a huge pet trade in slow lorises. However, it did have an impact. It engaged the public and there was a kickback and there was public dissemination. They were active in spreading the message. So I do believe that um, a carefully crafted message is possible. It is still possible to engage people's, if you like, take the cute response, continue to engage that and convert that into an empathetic response, which doesn't then become, oh, I need to, you know, possess that animal as, you know, as a pet. So I think there's ways of doing it, yes. And I do think there's risks as well, but I also think there's great benefits. And I think we have to. Um, stop being frightened of using it and you know start engaging with anthropomorphic narratives I do think it's a really great way of reaching children and young people too and I don't think we should be afraid of using that don't forget that in science communication when animal behaviorists want to talk to the public about their science they have to anthropomorphize it in their science communication it's it's one of the yeah. things that, that behaviorists hate is that they have to they have to anthropomorphize but that's how you have to do it. You have to talk to people in a language that they can understand. And I think we have to stop being frightened of that. Okay. Thanks, um, Richard, do you want to um, ask your question? Thanks, Natalie. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah. Great. Um, yeah, disclaimer, I'm a friend and colleague of Claire. <laughs> so, um, yeah, uh, so as we know, I think dominant discourses are very good at labeling challenges to their authority as ideological and uh, pretending that their own messaging and discourses are not in some way uh, ideological. Yes. <laughs> um, and I think most of us would agree that that children are um, manipulated in our meat culture into um, not reflecting on um, the realities of um, animal slaughter and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, your talk made me think of a, a form of media that I've been interested in for a few years, and, and that is children's picture books. Mm -hmm. um, because as you know, I do, do some teaching on early childhood studies and, and I've been uh, yeah trying to um, develop some kind of interest in, in taking critical animal studies and take, taking that together with um, childhood studies as, as well. Um, so how, in, in light of what you've been saying and the kind of positive construction of anthropomorphism, um, how, how can um, activist groups and so on kind of avoid the ac accusation of sort of man manipulating children through, through the creation of, um, um, kind of positive anthropomorphism in their in their kind of narrative building because that's that's almost the inevitable charge that will be 
um, levelled against um, such groups. Yeah, yeah and and I, I hate to say this, but I think that is just inevitable that that's going to happen because there's such a fear, there's such a fear of the sorts of stories that we need to tell children that that is the defense that they bring to this you know the ideas of you know manipulation and as you say you know that this is ideological and completely ignore the fact that meat culture is built on you know ideological grounds so um i i don't know that i've necessarily got an answer to how we defend ourselves against that charge because i just think that that is the charge that's always going to be brought against us but i don't think that again i'm going to say i don't think that should stop us doing this um i don't know that i've necessarily got a way of 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 refuting that you know at this at this point <laughs> uh, that's a really just... tough question richard by the way <laughs> <laughs> can i can i just come back and say say well i guess the the um you know the, the contesting me culture is actually trying to get at, at a closer um, approximation of the reality of what happens to um, non-human animals, whereas meat culture is trying to disguise it. And you know, there's a, just a, there's just a basic kind of um, fight over truth there. Yeah. Although they they might say that if you're using anthropomorphism in certain ways, that you're kind of veering away from the truth. Then I know there's yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't I don't think that I don't think that we even need to worry ourselves with that charge to be honest because all stories you know for children are anthropomorphic anyway so you know whether it's charlotte's web or babe or we're telling the truths of you know reality um the realities of the slaughterhouse which okia does it gives us the realities of the slaughterhouse in a in in quite a fantastical and disneyfied way but it's still the realities of it and children could engage with that and yes they hated it and yes many of them decided to go vegetarian much to their parents horror um you know, uh, but but they understood that those were the realities of it, and it was a way to actually reach them. Could could I just point out that um, um, I just saw uh, Kim Kim Stallwood in the chat said he'd like to say something briefly about his project. I'd be really interested in Kim, Kim's comments. Um, we, we had a yeah, I've just done a time check. We only yeah, we've only got a couple of minutes left. But really, do you want to hear what you've got to say um, as well, Tim? I'm also conscious there's another question in the chat. So if you're able to give it to a couple of minutes, that'd be great, Kim. Well, um, um, uh, thank you very much, Claire, for the presentation. It was really helpful, and and I think what I'd like to do is arrange a date where you and I can talk directly yeah. on on our own. But the issue of anthropomorphism. Is, is such a complex issue. And in writing the biography of, of, of Topsy, an elephant who was uh, killed in 1903, I'm, it's a narrative nonfiction style of writing whereby I'm writing it in three different voices. So there is her voice, my voice, my opinion, plus um, third person investigative reporting. So as, as, as the reader reads through the book, they'll read what happens to Topsy as she experiences it, as she feels and sees it. But then the next section will be in the third person investigation reporting that will then report upon what actually happened to her. So the reader will get multiple points of view about what happened to her life. And I, and I want to you know, hopefully the book will be seen as part of the rich tradition of Black Beauty, um, Watership Down, and, you know, many other novels that have been, um, well, mine's not a novel, but many other books about individual animals or groups of animals that have made a big difference in how people think about them. Yeah, that, that's a great strategy. Yeah, I really like that approach. And yeah, happy to have a chat, Kim, anytime. <laughs> um, and yeah, kind of thinking on what Richard said, it's like obviously the industry uses anthropomorphization for like their own means, but then also uses it as a weapon to criticise us, but they know it's effective. So yeah, um, I guess like Claire says, it's being mindful and intentional and making Absolutely. use of it. I think just just a very quick one to mention, for example, um, you may all have seen that, um, you know, farmers um, broadly, you know, then the certainly in the UK, the Farmers Union, you know, accuses people of anthropomorphizing um, cows and tells us that we shouldn't do that. And um, yet still has Happy Cow Weekend where farmers post pictures of their cows and tell us that they're happy on social media. And of course, they use happy cow imagery to sell dairy products. So, um, you know, I think what we have to do is we have to harness it as well because everyone else is using it and we need to do it and we need to do it on our own terms. 
Um, if people need to go, that's understandable, but I'm just going to put one last question to you, um, Claire, because it's quite an interesting one from Tristan, saying, any thoughts, suggestions regarding changing narratives about animals who are more alien than ourselves or less aesthetic, such as mussels or oysters? Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I think this is this is so important. And actually, I think this is where anthropomorphism is really important, because I, I believe that we can, um, through anthropomorphism, we can give a view into lives of animals that would be otherwise, you know, so distant from us that it's really, really difficult to, for people to make any kind of empathetic connections. So um, in, in one sense, I'm actually going to say that I believe this is the point where the more I'm going to say disney fies you go with this, the better, because you almost have to overtly anthropomorphize so that you can draw people in and engage them in the lives. As you say, I mean, um, I think the um, the example that you gave, mussels or oysters, you know, you you have to give a sense of um, what they experienced, you know, and I think that that can be incredibly difficult. You know, I think there's been problems with people trying to um, engage with fish. I mean, for a long time, people say, well, it's really, really hard. You can't get people to think about fish. And then we do get films about fish, for example, like Finding Dory and so on. We get characters that people can relate to um, and understand. So I think we have to create characters. We have to individuate. We have to use all of the narrative techniques that are our at our disposal. We have to tell stories that people understand. And a lot of those have to be perhaps um, about you know about relationships about the experiences of the ind of an individual oyster or an individual mussel um, and um, that I think it's it's a way of engaging audiences and it's probably the only way because through fact you are not going to reach people you can tell people the facts of the lives of oysters and mussels you are not going to reach people because they are too distant. Um, but if you give them a story, if you give them something which is framed in such a way that they can relate to it, and especially if you can offer some sort of relationship or emotional experience, something that is is shared that could be um, that can be identified with distress, pain, you know, whatever that might be, joy. Um, as long as there's something which is um, which is emotionally engaging, and the, and I think emotion is really important here. I think it's important that we create emotional life worlds for animals through these anthropomorphic narratives, because that's what people relate to, and that's what they find engaging. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, I think we should. That's why I think we should do it for animals that are really difficult for us to relate. Yeah. To. Thanks, Claire. I think it's that thing of show don't tell because like you say if you use facts or just say animals are sentient that doesn't really move people but if you're showing animals are sentient through the stories you tell I'm thinking of like my octopus teacher exactly so profoundly yeah. yeah 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 that's a really great example yes yeah oh thank you so much Claire and thank you everyone for joining us and I hope to see you at our next webinar next month thanks Take so care. much thank you bye thanks Claire